All right, everyone, please turn to Luke chapter 1. From verse 39. Our third week in Luke, and we're studying this amazing way that God came down, became flesh, experienced life right next to us. Uh, he's not a God who can't sympathize with us, not a God who can't understand what it's like uh, to go through what we have to go through, but he's a God who came down right next to us. Emmanuel, God with us. Um, how would that look like if God's planning to come to earth? And if he was born into the most luxurious palace on the planet, it'd be like a rabbit hole, <laughs> a dirty, muddy rabbit hole compared to heaven. Uh, so we sometimes think it's amazing he was born in a manger. It's amazing that he came <laughs> to be one of us and with us at all. And one of the things that's so striking to me, because in, in every once in a while you hear me talk about this, uh, there are people out there who think that the story of Jesus was just made up uh, by a bunch of Greek people. And they for some reason, decided to take this despised people group on the ragged edge of the Roman Empire and make one of those people their god. Uh, what strikes me is you go through the Old Testament, this Old Testament Jewish way of thinking, and then you're in the New Testament and the letters of Paul up until the very end and through most of the Gospels, and it's <clears throat> much more familiar to us uh, the way we, we think about God. But Luke, this investigative detective, does something really interesting for us. And we see in these first couple chapters, remember I said last week that the John the Baptist was kind of like an Old Testament prophet, like the last of the Old Testament prophets? We see something amazing here when we see the key actors, these, these Jewish men and women, thinking almost in an Old Testament sense, well, Christ is coming to them because they don't have... The New Testament, they don't have the Holy Spirit with them. The Holy Spirit would descend and go back up as needed. Uh, they don't have the history of Christ's earthly ministry. They don't have what makes New Testament Christianity yet. And so you see these faithful believers in God that God is honoring and God is approving of their faith, but they're relating to God in a way that's very different than the way we do. And I think that's the nuance there is so interesting. In these first couple chapters of Luke, this kind of Old Testament way of thinking, even as we see the coming of the Messiah. And God, we saw uh, the last two weeks, this wonderful old couple, he's a priest of God in the temple when God sends the angel Gabriel to speak with him. And then there's this uh, wonderful Jewish girl who was so brave, uh, so smart, we're going to see, so strong. And when the angel comes to her and says, your life is going to be turned totally upside down, she says, whatever, according to God. She doesn't say whatever, like a lot of teenagers might say. She says, whatever is God's will, uh, I, I acquiesce to that. I, I accept it. That's, isn't that so beautiful and maybe so rare? And I, and I want us to be challenged by that. I, in my life, am I happy to follow God only if he blesses what I want to do, and I'm going to do this, and look at me, I'm faithful, so bless, bless, bless. Or are we like Mary? She was living a faithful life, and God blew up her life. It's going to be totally different than she had planned. And a lot of people, obviously, were going to be critical and look down at her. Uh, virgin birth. Yeah, right. If uh, 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 a Muslim fellow on the Internet posted uh, this last week, he said, what would you do if the woman you were engaged to suddenly said, I'm pregnant, but don't worry, it's a virgin birth, it's by God, would you believe it? And I, I wrote, you know, I'd probably think she was crazy, but if this child grew up to die and then raise again, I'd have to reconsider. Uh, Jesus Christ, his own brothers did not fully follow him until after the resurrection. That's the stamp that we can know the virgin birth is true because people just don't die and pop back like that. And so we see her acquiescing to the will of God and accepting God's will for her life. And that's, that's a challenge for us. Brothers and sisters, 
How are we to God? I was studying this and feeling, wow, I kind of fall pretty short. Isn't it so easy to complain? Isn't it so easy to demand that, like we said last week, like you're using the force, God do it my way, as if we're some magician and God is some magic that we can, we can force. And w- Prayer is not magic. Prayer is us humbling ourselves to mighty God and, s- and laying out our requests, just like a child goes before a parent and has requests. But we're not manipulating or controlling God You can't pray and really get into it, so then I'm going to really get what I want this time. A beautiful prayer is, Lord, here I am. This is what I want, but I'll do your will, Lord. Lord, your will, not my will. And that's the prayer of Christ right there in the garden before he went to the cross. So we we have this old couple that God approves of, and he uses them to bring, remember, John the Baptist. John the Baptist was going to prepare the way for the Messiah. He was going to prepare the Jewish people, and that's why he had the baptism of repentance, and all the countryside, all the people were coming to John the Baptist. He was out in the wilderness. They were confessing their sins, and he was baptizing them, and he was preparing them then to accept the Messiah, Jesus Christ, when he came. Also, another interesting thing we're going to see, and you may have already picked up on it, out of all the Gospels, it's Luke that gives us our main source for our Christmas stories that we have. Our, our best insights into Christmas and the birth of Christ come from Luke. I am so thankful and so grateful that this fellow, remember last week we said, one, he, he's either a Hellenistic Jew, right, or he's a Gentile believer, right? So he was not one of the apostles, but he, he has this friend, uh, noble Theophilus, and he He says, I'm going to write down, I've investigated everything so you can know the matter from the beginning. And after he does the gospel, he's the writer of the book of Acts, remember? And he gives us the history of the beginning of the church. The neat thing about the book of Acts is it doesn't have an end because the history of the church is continuing on. And so I'm so thankful that God saw fit to bring in Luke, not one of the apostles, uh, not one of the people who was with Jesus, but somebody who investigated and, and, and interviewed people and talked with people and wrote us down this story. So let's look now, Luke chapter 1 from verse 39. 39 through 45. <clears throat> At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea. So... Mary, uh, at that time, she hears from this angel Gabriel that you're going to have a baby, uh, and it, it's a big deal. She also hears that uh, her kinsman, her relative, Elizabeth, and some of your Bibles may say cousin, but the truth of the matter is that word is vague. She's a relative. We don't know what kind of relative she is. Maybe it could have been an aunt, could have been a second cousin or whatnot. But the angel Gabriel said, even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word of God will ever fail. And she says, I am the Lord's maidservant. Uh, May it be done unto me according to your word. So Mary gets up. She hurried. uh, Maybe she, I don't know, maybe she told her parents, I'm going to go help take care of my relative. She's old, and she's going to have a baby. She's going to need somebody to help around the house. I don't know what. But she went to the to the hill country of Judea, which depending on where in Judea she was, it was a three to five day journey. So probably she went with a caravan or a bunch of other travelers. It wouldn't have been safe for a young girl on the road alone. When she entered Zechariah's home, remember that's the priest. Remember he couldn't talk for a while because an angel appears before him. And all I can say, the angel says, you're going to have this son and he's going to bring source. He says, uh, how do I know you're telling the truth? And Gabriel says, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of the Lord, and you're not going to talk. <laughs> and so he couldn't talk until the baby was born. So she enters Zacharias in, in uh, Elizabeth's home and uh, greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb. And this idea here is leaped for joy. Just so happy. And, and that's what we go back when we saw uh, the prophecy about John the Baptist, it said he would have the Holy Spirit from, from even within the womb. He was going to have the Holy Spirit. So even as a baby, the Holy Spirit within, uh, within John recognized 
that uh, the Messiah was there in, in uh, prenatal form. And he leaps for joy. Uh, I Listen, I understand that this is not scientifically possible. Isn't that the point? That's the point. If you're going to believe the rest of this book, if you're going to believe that there is a God who made this huge, giant universe and made human beings the way we are, why would you doubt the virgin birth? Why would you doubt that John the Baptist could jump for joy? This, please, there's a word for this. It's called miraculous. This is a miracle. We're not going to explain this scientifically. This is what the Bible said. This is God's revelation to us. And again, if God is found faithful, there's no reason for us to doubt these kinds of things. If God is faithful, then there's no reason for us to doubt these details. So the baby is, is putting this, here it comes a gal who says, I'm pregnant and I've never had sex. There's going to have to be a stamp here. And John the Baptist already says this. He's, he's testifying to who this baby is, even while he himself is still in the womb. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth herself was filled with the Holy Spirit. So now we see an, uh, the angel came to Mary, the angel came to uh, Zechariah, and now Elizabeth, this beautiful old woman, this woman of faith, who all her life, she had prayed for a child, prayed for a child, never got a child. Now she has this miraculous birth. She's filled with the Holy Spirit of God. In a loud voice, the, the little translation is a shout. In this loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women. Blessed are you among women. Mary, you are blessed. And blessed is the child that you bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Isn't that beautiful? Here's an old woman. <coughs> She's filled with the Holy Spirit. And there's a teenager girl, teenage girl standing before her. And she's humble. The old woman is humble. We saw last week that Mary was humble. Now we see this week Elizabeth is humble. I think there's a theme here. God puts a stamp of approval on humble people, doesn't he? In this, this woman who's much older and the authority says, why am I so favored that you would come to me, the mother of my Lord? You notice Mary is not a, the lady. Mary is not uh, the Lord, but she's the mother of the Lord. I'm going to trip over that plant on her. Uh, as soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Be there was no texting back then. There was no email or phone calls, cell phones. This is probably the first time she, she sees Mary, and right away she's speaking prophetically. She knows that Mary is pregnant. Mary's not showing. She just became pregnant. She came right away after she heard from the angel. And already Elizabeth is speaking these words because of the Holy Spirit within her. As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promise to her. So she's talking about Mary. Mary, you are blessed because you believed. Mary heard from the angel and Mary believed. And, and Elizabeth says, you are blessed. So in chapter 1, we see two women, both very humble, but they've chosen to play great roles in God's history on our planet. This, this is one of those moments that we, we say that the, the creation, right, big deal. The fall, that was a big deal. The coming of Christ, the birth of Christ to deal with our sins, his death on the cross where he paid the debt for all of us. He paid for your sin. And then three days later, he rose up. Because death is not strong enough to keep him down. He loves us so much that love was so overwhelming that the, the grave could not hold him. These are a few, there's just a few huge moments in history, and God chose these two women to play important roles in these huge points, in these, these this huge point in history. Right at the beginning of God's incarnation, God setting aside all the prerequisites of his glory, God coming to a place where he has to eat, he has to take a bath, brush his teeth, sleep. He gets tired. He can work in on his carpentry work. He can stub his or hit his thumb. God incarnating himself. Elizabeth is an old godly woman, humble, moved by God's 
by God's Holy Spirit, she speaks as a prophetess. Mary is a young girl. Remember we said last week, possibly 13 years old when she was engaged. Almost certainly less than 20. It would have been rare if she had been older than 20. She is visited by an angel who greets her with the words, An angel, hail, favored one, the Lord is with you. And she too, like her kinsman Elizabeth, is humble, full of faith and willing to accept a difficult calling from the Lord, a hard path in life. And are we humble? Will we accept a difficult calling from the Lord? Or we just want to have God approve of our own plans, whatever we choose? J. Vernon McGee says of Mary, let us call her blessed. The Bible says she's going to be called blessed. Brothers and sisters, let us call Mary blessed. I said last week, because of what we think are the Catholic excesses, let's not run away from understanding how important Mary is and what an incredible example she is to us. And I, I spoke to the, the young girls last week, the teenagers. This is a mighty woman. This is a woman worth emulating respecting. Jane Verdon McGee says, let us call her blessed. We don't make her a goddess and kneel before her, but we do need to call her blessed. It was her glorious privilege to be the mother of the Son of God, to bring him into the world. We should not play it down, but we should not play it up either. She was a wonderful person, and it was no accident that she was chosen by God. It was his definite decision, and God makes no mistakes. And probably one of the reasons God chose her was the depth of her faith. She was a young woman, a teenager most likely, and she trusted God. I don't want us to get too theoretical here. Oh, yeah, I trust God. I have some good news and bad news. Good news is, trust God, you get to go to heaven. Love Jesus, you get to go to heaven. Everybody knows that, right? That's why he died on the cross. Here's the bad news. Every Christian since the time of Christ till now that put their faith in, that lived mighty lives and good lives, you know, they, they, throughout most of the Christian era, they were probably dying in their 40s and 50s. They loved God. They were used by God. They had a purpose for God. 60s, 70s. Maybe 80s. Few, very few people get past 90, 100. Of course, at a certain point, all you're doing really is delaying your time into heaven, aren't you? My point is, is that we have our agenda, our plan. God bless me. I need a bigger this. I need a bigger that. I need more of this. I need more of that. And I. And it's okay to pray for those things. Tr truly, it is. God loves you. He's like a dad. Go to your dad, your heavenly father. Talk to him. If any of you are sick, you better believe I'm praying for your healing. I always do. We've seen some answers to prayer. But the biggest prayer, the best prayers, the prayers that get God's attention are, Lord, your will, not my will be done. Lord, let it be done unto me according to your will. Lord, here I am, send me. Lord, here I am, use me. Father, I'd like to set aside this time of suffering, but if you're not going to do that, Lord, please use me to bring you glory in this suffering. How does that look practically? How about having joy when your life is not working out? How about... Not being that person in the hospital that's so ornery the nurses can't stand to be around you, but is bringing a blessing even as you're facing difficult, possibly life-ending circumstances. You are determined, I will be a blessing to the people around me. Lord, your will be done in my life. She's a teenager, and she trusted the Lord. When he told her everything's going to change, it's not going to be the way you had been hoping. 
It's not going to be according to the plans you've been dreaming about since you were a little girl. And when she goes to visit Mar Elizabeth here, you get a sense that it was a joyful meeting. She wasn't going there depressed. Oh, no. God just ruined my life. Oh, no. Everybody thinks that I'm not a good girl. She went there filled with joy at the privilege of being able to be a part of God's plan. I want you to see what Mary says in response to, and some people think Elizabeth's words there were kind of like a mini song. Uh, maybe she sang them out. Uh, uh, they were poetic. Mary responds with a poem of her own, a song, a canticle, and a lot of the ideas here, she puts in her own words, but she's taking it right out of the Old Testament. What does that show you? This little girl knew her Old Testament. <laughs> she knew the words of God, and she's able to not only repeat them word for word, but she's taking them and putting them in the own context of her life. It's easy to just quote from the Bible. She's taking the Bible and putting it in the context of her situation. And she's talking to God on a very personal level, that she's calling him my Savior. And there's a big difference between people who could say, Jesus, isn't he the Savior? He died on the cross for people's sins. And saying, Jesus died on the cross for my sins because I needed to be saved because of all the things I've said, all the things I've thought, all the things I've done, all the things that I failed to do that I should have done, all the times that I let God down, all the times that I let down the people around me that love me, all the times that I let myself down and didn't live up to my own standards. And Jesus paid for all of that. So I'm completely forgiven on the cross. See the difference between somebody who's talking theoretically, oh, yeah, he's a Savior, he died. I think if people trust him, they go to heaven, right? And somebody says, no, he's my Savior. He died for me. And Jesus uh, is the Savior of everyone who will come to him and believe and accept that and and Mary is saying, God, he's my Savior. Listen to this. This, this uh, song is called the Magnificat. And, and Magnificat, it, it comes from the very first words here, my soul glorifies the Lord, is Latin for my soul magnifies. You like take a magnifying glass, you make it big. God is big in my life, is she saying. Brothers and sisters, is God big in your life? Or is something going to eclipse God? Is, is, is money or, or fear or, or popularity? or worries and concerns, what's getting in the way of God in your life? Mary says, God is big in my life. God chose this girl because he was big in her life. The early church, actually, we know, this is one of the very first songs that the early church used as a hymn. Isn't that neat? The early church grabbed a hold of this, and in a, in a, in there, was, there was just a handful of songs from the early church, and then Christians in all sorts of churches throughout history of Christianity have been singing this. Of course, we don't know what tune they use. It's been used by various tunes in different places in different countries. But this is a song that has been sung uh, and is still sung today in churches all over the world. And as I read, I want you to think of how mature this child is, this young girl. Think of ourselves responding to difficult circumstances the way she did. Think of her faith in difficult times. Not only was her life difficult, right? She's suddenly pregnant. With, out of wedlock, but her country is under harsh Roman oppression. It's been a war zone between the Parthian Empire and the Roman Empire. And then on top of it, your own religious leaders in the temple are corrupt. They're trying to rip people off. People come from all over the, the known world to worship God at the temple. Jewish people coming, because Jews are scattered everywhere, they're coming and they're there to worship God, and when they get there, they're being ripped off. Everything around her looks kind of disappointing from a human point of view. Think of who, think of how Jewish this song is. And again, in the context of the Old Testament, it's not the way you and I would have written it. It's not the way American, modern American Christians would have written it. But I want you to listen as I read through this. And think about this. This is the, the mother who gave birth to our Savior, the mother who uh, nourished him at her breasts, the mother who raised him, the mother who probably cried over, over his scraped knee when he was little, and then the mother whose own heart was pierced with a sword when she saw him hanging on the cross. 
And this little girl of faith, please listen. Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord. My soul makes God big in my life. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, not the Savior. Brothers and sisters, do we save our rejoicing when only things go right in our life? Because the honest truth is you're not loving God, you're loving the blessings. I'm guilty of it too. I don't want to be. It's hard, isn't it? She says, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God. He's my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. You know, she's proud, but it's not a bad pride. She's proud that God's using her in this way. All generations are going to call me blessed. And by the way, she's right. Is another prophecy that's been fulfilled. People say, any prophecy has been fulfilled? Yeah, I know quite a few. Uh, and for the mighty one, the mighty one, what a great name to call God, has done great things for me. Are you good at keeping a list of answered prayer in your life? Are you good at keeping track of all the ways God has blessed you, of the way he's forgiven you and accepted you and loved you and brought you into a, a family of people who also believe God? Or are you really good at keeping a list of things you're upset about that you want to complain about? She said, the mighty one, he's done great things for me. Holy is his name. That's something significant there, too. There's a lot of depth to this girl, isn't there? She's not just saying, oh, God is, is, is cool. He's really nice. He's, he's my best buddy. He's saying he is holy. God is other. He is perfect, without blemish. God has no sin. He's holy. We're not. The Bible says our, our righteousness, our good deeds, the best that we can offer God. When we're, when we're doing our best, when we're, when we're sharing our faith, when we're, when we're being a blessing for somebody else and bringing them food or taking care of them when they're not feeling well, when we're singing out hymns, when we're praying, when we're pre preaching, that our righteousness, our best things we can give God are still like filthy, dirty rags. His righteousness, his goodness, his holiness Mary understood that Jesus is that uh, that God is holy. His mercy extends to those who, what's your Bible say? Fear Him. Does anybody else in the Bible say fear? The beginning of wisdom starts with the fear of the Lord. That's right. She seems to understand that wise girl. His mercy. God has mercy for those who fear Him from generation to generation. And just like there could be a generational curse, like el alcoholism or child abuse, there could be generational blessings. When we put our faith in God and train up our children to follow Jesus, and that goes from one generation to the next generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. She knows that God is opposed, opposed to pride in our hearts. And I, this terrified me. I remember in high school, dealing with pride, still do, and thinking, I don't want God to be opposed to me. God, break my pride. Break my pride. Break it down. Because otherwise, you'll be my enemy, and I don't want that. He has brought down the high and mighty from their thrones, but he has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things. And here she's talking then more than just food, guys. She said they filled her with good things, those who are, are spiritually hungry with good things, but the rich went away empty. Well, if it was food, the rich don't go away empty, do they? The rich go away with T-bone steak and lobster. But these rich are going away spiritually empty, and that's what she's talking about. You filled up people who are spiritually hungry with good things, but the people who are self-satisfied and full of themselves, they go away empty. If you're full of yourself, there's no room for the Holy Spirit. He who has helped uh, he has helped his servant Israel. Israel is the people of the Jewish people. Remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised to our ancestors. Remember I said this is so, so Jewish. And in the whole Bible, nobody has spoken about more than Abraham. No human being has spoken about more than Abraham. And she's saying, you have this plan with Abraham, and you gave this promise that, 
that the, the whole world would be blessed through him. And that promise is coming through. When God blessed the whole world, would he be blessed through Abraham, his seed? It's coming true right now, and she knows it in her life. She's carrying the fulfillment of God's promise. This is an amazing song by a young gal. This is beautiful. I saw that song. Remember that song from the 90s, early 90s, I Want to Be Like Mike, Michael Jordan, basketball player? I want to be like Mary. <laughs> let it be done unto you. Uh, let it be done unto me as you have said. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. Well, remember the angel had told Mary that uh, Elizabeth is six months pregnant, so she stays about three months. I told you last week that uh, Japanese people say that a pregnancy is 10 months. Americans say it's nine months. So I looked up on the internet, and it says 40 weeks, which is 10 months, or 38 weeks, which is nine and a half. And then they said, and there's about five week leeway on either side. Or, so then I looked up, what did the ancient Jews think? And this is, uh, this is what this scholar said. The ancients sometimes spoke of pregnancy lasting 10 months, but they commonly understood it to last nine months. So there is no, <coughs> we live with modern science and nobody can tell me it's nine or 10 months. <coughs> Anyways, she was approximately six months pregnant when Mary got this message. She traveled to the hill country of Judea and she stayed there uh, for approximately three months. Um, it's no way she left two or three days before the baby was born, right? So probably what happened here is she stayed until John the Baptist was born and then and uh, she went home. Two women, Elizabeth and Mary, and I was just thinking of this, and it's such a blessing to think of these two gals living together in this home, in, in uh, Zachariah and Elizabeth's home, living in a first century Jewish home in the hill country. So maybe nice view, right? Hill country of Judea, no doubt. They're, they're excited, right? They're talking about their babies. One's an old woman who should not be pregnant. One's a, a gal who's not married yet, she should also not be pregnant. But they're talking about their pregnancies and about their children. And I'm, I'm sure, what kind of children are these going to grow up to be? Angels came to us. What's going to happen? The first child is going to grow up to be a great prophet who would prepare the way for the Messiah. He was going to speak bold, compelling truth. And he was going to get his head cut off. The other was God in flesh. God who saw the pain in the world and loved us enough that he didn't just ignore us. He just didn't sit up on his throne in heaven. He saw the divorce. He saw the pain. He saw the war, the hunger, the suffering, the, the child abuse, the, the angry words that go back and forth. God saw everything, and he said, I'm going to do something about it. He came down in person. He set aside all of his glory and all the prerequisite, prerequisites of his authority, set it all aside, and was born as a humble baby, so that he could die for sin, so that he could make a way that everybody could go to heaven. If they would just put their faith in him and accept it. God doing something about this messed up world. And Jesus, he would preach the kingdom of God, saying it is near. The kingdom of God is coming. And he would be nailed to a cross by jealous religious figures and corrupt and a corrupt Roman official, both of these babies would die young, die as young men. Those two girls, two gals, living in that small home, probably in this Judean hillside, talking together, excited about their babies. The whole world was going to be different after that. You could have been in Rome. You could have been in Damascus. You could have been in the Parthian Empire, the Chinese Empire, you could have been anywhere, and nothing was bigger than what was happening in that little house with Elizabeth and Mary. And the whole world is different today because of that. Amazing. <coughs> they knew it was big, but I wonder if they could have known how things would change and how God was using them in such a huge way. It started with two women. An old woman and a teenage girl, both with miraculous pregnancies by the power of God in a town in Judea, living together and preparing for the births of their sons. 
It's beautiful how God works. Quiet days. Maybe some days they even got it on each other's nerves. Two good girls, two good people can get on each other's nerves. Maybe they had to work things out. Maybe Zechariah, as much as he loved his wife and as much as he saw this young gal, she's a woman of excellence, maybe sometimes he thought he'd just need to sit outside for a while to peace and quiet. And the whole world turned. Heaven knew what was going on. The whole world was oblivious except for this small group of families. Zechariah 4.10 says, do not despise the day of small beginnings. God knows where it's going. Don't look down at day of small beginnings. Brothers and sisters, don't ever think your life doesn't count. Don't ever think that your life is unimportant. Don't ever think that whether you share your faith, it doesn't matter. If you share your faith, Maybe one person will become a believer. Or maybe you think nobody became a believer, but somebody else was listening, and they told their family. Some guy was talking about Jesus. I don't know, and that caused this person to go to their church and talk. See, just like dominoes, one after another, I mean, if just one person is in heaven because you lived your faith, don't despise the day of small beginnings. When we love people in the name of Christ and bring just one cup of water to a thirsty person, <clears throat> when somebody's feeling lonely and rejected, like nobody cares, and you love them in the name of Jesus. Brothers and sisters, just one small house in this beautiful hill country of Judea, the whole world changed. And God can use our little, what we think, our little acts of service to change the eternal destiny of somebody else. Let's love God. Let's love other people. Let's be more like Mary and Elizabeth who receive from God, who don't become bitter. Elizabeth, all those decades without a baby and yet without bitterness, let's not be bitter when life doesn't work out our way. Instead, let's say, Lord, here I am. Let it be done unto me as you have said. And I'm here in your workplace. Where do you work? Say, I am God's woman on spot. In your school, where, where do you go to school? I'm God's man here in my neighborhood. We're God's family. Help us to be a blessing to others. Lord, we want other people to see you're real through our lives. Help us to love each other. Help us to love other people. Brothers and sisters, we have a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful story of how God can work through small things to bring out huge, big results. You want to be faithful? You want to be like Mary in this? like Elizabeth, well, let's just bow our heads and ask God. Say, God, help us do this. In your hearts now, don't just listen to a prayer. It's not part of the sermon. In your heart, be praying, God, let this be true of me too. Pray these words after me in your heart. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Lord God, here I am. Lord, I surrender to you. Don't want to fight you anymore. Lord, not my will but yours be done. Father, I love to come to you and pray for blessings because I know you hear. But Lord, if things don't work out my way, I pray that you'll find me faithful. I pray when you look down from heaven, you'll find me still walking in your joy and your peace. Lord, make me an instrument of blessing to those around me. Let me be an ambassador of grace, Lord a worker of righteousness. God, help me to bring peace to those around me. Lord, I pray that I carry the cross of Christ, lifting up my own cross every day, Lord, whatever trials are in my life, Lord, and carrying them in a way that brings you glory, not me. And Father, help us not to despise the day of small beginnings because we don't know, even from a small start, what good you can bring out of it. When we humble ourselves, bow before you, Lord, Lord, and serve you. Lord, I pray that as you look down from heaven, you find a whole church full of people right now who are bowing before you, Lord, and eager to be used by you. Thank you, God, for your grace. Thank you for your love. Help us to walk in those. 
In your name we pray, amen. Hello, my name is Pastor Dan Wolf from Foundation Bible Church. Thank you for watching Foundation Television. Uh, the reason our church does this is so we can reach out into our community and share the love of Jesus Christ. We have a good God. We have a God who loves us, a real God who really cares. And it's he's put it on our hearts to try and uh, share this message that God is there for people, that there is God who's willing to meet them where they are at and to love them and forgive them. But it's also on my heart that uh, there's parts of church that you just... Uh, you just can't experience in front of a television screen or on a computer screen. Uh, Jesus wants us to come together as one family, all different kinds of people from different nationalities, different income levels, different education levels, maybe people that normally wouldn't even uh, hang out outside of a church setting, but we're united by Jesus and he brings us all together. But I really want to encourage you, if you're able to, to take that step, leave your comfort zone at home, uh, find a good church to go to. We have so many good churches in the area, and I'm sure you're going to go there. You're going to be loved. You're going to be blessed. You're going to be encouraged. People are going to care about you. There's no reason we have to do life alone at home, but we can get out and meet with other people who are on this journey to, to, to know God better and to allow him to reach into our lives and, and uh, let his grace rest upon our lives. So uh, again, I just want to encourage you. Thank you for watching. But if you can get out on a Sunday morning, boy, we would love to see you. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.